Hey guys, before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to remind everybody to please use the Amazon links. This uh, supports what we do here on Talking Metal. We get a little kickback on any purchase you make when you go to Amazon. The, The only thing extra you have to do is go to Talking Metal first and use our Amazon links to link you over to Amazon. Everything's the same price. Uh, You still get the same shopping experience. It's just one small additional step that really helps us out. Why Amazon do this, I have no idea, but they do give us a small kickback on anything you purchase on Amazon by using the Talking Metal links. And they're located in the show notes. If you're looking at us uh, on your phone, you just got to pull up the episode show notes, go to the Talking Metal section on TalkingMetal.com, go into the podcast and just pull up uh, any episode and you'll see the, the links to Amazon located in that blog post for the episode. If you're on a laptop, just go to TalkingMetal.com, you'll see the links right away. Good news for our Canadian listeners, we now have the Amazon links working for people in Canada, which is a brand new thing, and I'm told if we don't get anybody from Canada using the links, they close down the links after like 30 days or something, so please go use them. If you're a Canadian listener, uh, I'm begging you, go go use them so we can keep this, this open for Canadian listeners of Talking Metal. If you, if you live in Canada right now, I'm sure one of you is considering going to Amazon today to buy something. Just do that additional step. Go to TalkingMetal.com first and link over to Amazon using our Canadian Amazon links. All right? All right. Anyways, sorry for rambling here at the beginning of the episode about Amazon. Now let's just do some rock and roll. We got astronomy on the show today and uh, Jim Rhoda from Fireball Ministry. Here we go. Hey, this is Jim Rhoda from Fireball Ministry, and you're listening to Talking Metal with my good friend, Mark Striegel. Hey, it's John Astronomy coming to you on a brand new episode of Talking Metal. I am in the silver spacecraft. Mark Striegel is at his domain. Yes, the the hovercraft circling the silver spacecraft. How are you, John? Hey, I am doing great. I am doing great. This is the first day off I've had in a very, very long time. Wow. Um, I uh, had a Like It gig two nights ago. Uh, I usually don't get home until a day or so later at these gigs because uh, the antics are so insane after them that uh, it, it takes like a full day just to travel like about two miles. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, you'll have to fill it's me true. in uh, on the details. Definitely, I want yeah, to hear yep, about yep. that. Um, yeah. And uh, real quick, we have Jim Rhoda from Fireball Ministry on the show today. He's got a, a new record out, Fireball Ministry, new album out. It's really, really good. We're going to talk to him in in just a little bit. And uh, so, J- John, you're not in Australia on the Ace Tour, well, correct? Just correct. Sitting this one out. Yeah. Now, what happens is, is when you go all the way to Australia and then to New Zealand, it usually takes uh, about a month total uh, to yeah. do something like that. And uh, as some of you may know, I do uh, a month. work. Where do you go? Yeah, back, three weeks to a month. Oh. Yeah. I mean, not not to get there and back, but just to do all the shows. And and you got to leave. You know, you've got to get there a few days early right. to get situated they call it an acclimation period so yes. you you go a few days early so you can get used to the time zone and all that kind of stuff and i would love to do that um my issue is that as most of you know i do have a full time uh gig in the television industry in new york new york so um although i'm capable of doing a 3 week ace tour in the United States, um, at the moment, uh, I'm not capable of doing uh, one out of the country, and you know that is that long. Uh, and, the, and the reason is, is that when I when I do a USA tour, there are always days off built into the tour. And when there is a day off, I fly back to New York and I work uh, my my regular gig. So even if the tour is three weeks or a month. I'm not gone for a full month, but um, in this particular case, when when you go all the way, you know, across the planet to Australia, you can't shoot back on your days off to work at uh, your your normal day job. So, so what I have done is I'm still handling the tour um, in a management level capacity, and uh, I have a great tour manager. His name is Jeff Gilmer. 
uh, working uh, with the ACE crew. And Jeff has been a veteran of the ACE crews, uh, recommended by our uh, great, great legendary sound man, Night Bob. Um, so on tours that Night Bob doesn't do sound, uh, Jeff will do uh, front of house sound and he'll be a production or what I like to call road manager. I think the new term is a production manager. And then, then I, of course, am the U.S. tour manager. And, and everybody has like a, a bunch of different uh, things that they're responsible for. And it's, it's a pretty cool system. Now, when you go on like a huge tour, like, a, like let's say a Guns N' Roses tour, there, there, are, se- there are several more layers of, of people involved in these gigantic tours. Why don't we talk about Jim Rota, our friend from back in the MTV library days and um, the old MTV production days, uh, MTV Networks, I should say. Yeah. And uh, Jim Rota has a, a great band. Uh, we've been fans of his band, Fireball Ministry, for a long time. Yeah, they were and, one of the uh, early tell, tell guests. Yeah, they were one of the early guests on the Talking Metal podcast. I'm guessing they were on this show back like in 2006 ish. Although yeah. I don't mm-hmm. know. It could have been 2005. It could have even yeah, been 2007. I don't know. Somewhere around there, they were on Talking Metal. And. Uh, Jim or the Reverend James Rhoda, I guess he goes by both uh, both titles. Um, he worked. You may have been working in the library, the videotape library, back in those days. I believe he was in VH1 production at the same time I was there. Actually, I know he definitely was. I want to say he was on Pop Up Video. I'm fairly certain he he did a couple things at, at VH1, and I think he was on Pop Up Video. Uh, we start this interview talking about a guy named Luke Littell, who no one's going to know who that is. I remember he, Luke Littell, yeah, and I just in, saw him in Vegas. Yeah, he was a fellow um, MTV Networks VH1 employee where we all worked back in the 90s. And, and every time I go to Vegas, he's out there. I think he was doing camera work for Kiss when I was out there for the uh, the residency. I know House of Blues and... Uh, Hard rock and stuff out in Vegas, I think, use him to do a lot of camera work. And he was definitely doing the Kiss show when I was out there. And I, I feel like there was another show I saw out there that he was also doing the camera yeah. work for. Yeah, I see him every time. Um, the last few times Ace has played Vegas, uh, we've done the – what's the uh, bowling place in Brooklyn? Brooklyn Bowl. Uh, Brooklyn Bowl. Yeah, we yeah, do Brooklyn Vegas, Bowl, yeah. Vegas. And uh, Luke has been there. And guess who was there the last time with Luke? Who's that? Another friend of ours, Rick Orlando. Oh, right. Another yeah. guy from back in the day. And it's uh, it's just funny how that 90s era MTV Networks, VH1, MTV, Nickelodeon spawned so many friends that we've remained friends with through the years. Uh, Jim is somebody I'm not in touch with on a regular basis, but he is definitely still a friend. He's gone on to do some incredible stuff, not just producing bands and and working with his own band fireball ministry he produced a series for hbo which is just incredible i mean i I can't imagine getting that far i'm still producing promos you know for terrible cable shows (laughs) i probably shouldn't say that but anyways uh yeah jim jim has done some incredible work He's going to tell us all about that. Sonic Highways is the show I'm referring to. When he mentions the the name Dave, he's obviously referring to Dave Grohl. I know a few times he just said, well, Dave did this and Dave did that. Just so you know, he's talking about Dave Grohl. There's some great stories about you know Dave Grohl, Tom Petty, uh, who else? Luke Littell <laughs> in, in this yeah, interview. Yeah. So stay tuned. And we also managed to talk to him about the... Uh, the new Fireball Ministry record, which we're going to check out right now before we get into the interview. Uh, The album is called Remember the Story. This song is called Back on Earth. Hey, it's Mark Striegel of Talking Metal and on the line from Fireball Ministry, Jim Rhoda. Jim, how are you? How are you, man? I'm good. It's been a while. Good. It's to... always exciting to see. A, yeah, total. Sorry, it's always been, it's always exciting to see a two hundred one number come up on the caller ID. Yeah, well, you're originally from New Jersey, right? That's right. Where Where in Jersey are, did you grow up? I was born in beautiful downtown Teaneck. Okay. And then we were there, and we were Dumont people, and then we moved up to Sussex County when I uh, when I got a little older. 
Oh, cool. And is that where you know Luke from? Luke Latelli? He, because he's from Sussex County, right? Yeah, Luke. Yeah, Luke and I. Luke and I and John Ramsey, who I actually produced Dave Grohl stuff with, actually went to high school together. And Luke and John Ramsey and I uh, also, we well, all three of us went to high school together. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's kind of crazy for the listeners they, they who can't don't shake me after thirty years. <laughs> right. For the Sorry. listeners who don't know, we're talking about uh, a mutual friend, uh, Luke, who's now out in Las Vegas. But let's let's talk about the the music. Fireball Ministry is back with a great new record. Remember the story. Thank you. There's, there's some really, I mean, seriously, I was just talking to uh, Rob Dukes from Exodus, and I'm always picking uh, ex- oh, Exodus. Oh, yeah, I love him. Yeah, and I'm always picking his brain to what movies he's into and what music he's listening to. And he, he told me, uh, he said, you know, I can't, I can't stop listening to the new Fireball Ministry. So I, I thought that was... That's uh, so cool. Yeah, that's a true story. And it's, it is a great record. Remember the story. It's out now. It's on Amazon, iTunes, Spotify. I just bought the CD. Everything. Uh, yeah, cool. And we're talking with Jim Rhoda, who is the the singer and one of the guitar players in Fireball Ministry. He's also a filmmaker, TV producer, uh, producer of <laughs> other albums by other bands, and we'll try to talk to you about, uh, at least touch upon all this, but let's talk about the new record. You guys are back, and I, I remember the last time I interviewed you in person in New York City, it had to be probably 11, 12 years ago at this point, and Johnny Cho was in the band. Yeah, it's been He's, a while. He's, I guess, I didn't realize this, he's in Stone Sour now, and you have... Uh, yeah, yeah. Which is great, good for him. He got, a way, he got a way better paying, yeah. he got a way better paying, uh, he went on to a bigger corporation. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. the Stone Sour guys, I mean, like, for, you know, you know, Corey, again, I've worked with in the past, and he's an amazing person, and uh, Roy Mayorga is an old friend of mine, so it's just, that band's kind of, like, a, just a a big bunch of our friends so that's it's amazing i'm i like i have not been happier to see a bunch of guys get you know success this year than any any other band it's just been so great watching like that record do so well and those guys all be so happy you know yeah absolutely and i didn't realize that your ex-bass player johnny was now with him too so that's great and yeah yeah Let's talk about your new bass player, though, because this guy played bass on one of my favorite records. I've heard of him, yeah. Welcome to Sky Valley. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us who's in the band now playing bass? And the bass playing on this new record by Fireball Ministry is just incredible. I mean, he, you can hear his style and yeah. his sound yeah. all over it. Uh, tell us who's the new bass yeah, player. Yeah, and that's kind of the awesome thing. So Scott Reeder, former bassist of Caius, is, has been in our band for a little bit now. We were... Uh, we were, I was working on the Sound City documentary, and I wanted Scott to be one of the people that Dave interviewed, Dave Grohl interviewed for the movie, because, you know, Caius had done Welcome to Sky Valley, I think. I definitely blew for the Red Sun, and I think Welcome to Sky Valley out of Sound City. So, right. you know, it was uh, kind of awesome to have him there. And then uh, Dave invited him to play on the song with actually Corey Taylor, once again, from Slip from a. Uh, Stone Sour and Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. And then I remember at those sessions, Scott and I just kind of started talking. I mean, we had known each other from over the years, you know, our bands. He was also in a band called Unita for a bit. We played right. with them a bunch. And, and yeah, yeah, and yada, yada. So we knew each other. And we were, we got, to, I got to talking to him and I was just like, hey, how come you, know, you haven't been playing? you know, like with a, with a steady band or anything the last few years. And he was like, you know, man, no one's asked me. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't think I have to ask uh, anybody in my band, you know, for permission. So I'm just going to ask you to be in our band because you just got asked to play that first motorhead cruise. Right. So we ended up going out on that with Scott, that, that crew, that first cruise show was like the first show we played with Scott on the first motorhead cruise. Cause you know, you do two shows. So that was the first show. And that was how it happened. Like it was just basically like, Scott was like, I'm not doing nothing. And we're like, we're not doing too much. So do you want to not do too much together? Wow. And then this all kind of has now turned to like a real thing. So. Yeah. Sorry. Awesome. And I mean, his, again, his bass playing too really brings kind of a, a new element to the band. Um, because he's got the, the distinct sound and you get, you really let him, 
just kind of run wild on the songs. I mean, just again, great stuff. Yeah, we 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 believe that if you're gonna have like you know you're gonna have somebody like that in your band, you might as well you know, let that that person stretch their legs as much as they can because it's not like he's ever gonna come up with anything that isn't amazing. You know, it's right. always gonna be amazing. He's he's an amazing musician and he's an even more amazing person. So he's a joy to be around, and we're extremely lucky to all be playing together. We're just happy people still want to hear this kind of music you know that's the best part to be honest absolutely we heard the song back on earth earlier um we're gonna play some more of the the album in in just a bit but as far as these songs go you know it's been a while since we've had a new fireball ministry record have these songs been sitting around for a while or were they all written more recently you know coming up to the release of the record the only song that is you know from I would say an earlier time is Scott had put out a single a few years ago with the song Weaver's Dawn on it. And Weaver's Dawn is probably the only, uh, is the only song that's, you know, got any age to it. Cause for the most part, I mean, like we, we wrote all these songs together for this record and we wrote them all, you know, in the time that we were, you know, getting ready to do, you know, production for the record. I mean, it was written so amazingly like natural and, and just like, Oh, but all the songs are brand new. I mean, nothing was laying around. It wasn't like a, a, what do you call it? A different kind of truth Van Halen story or anything right. like that. Like it was honestly, this is all brand new music. And I think that like, again, that's the only way to really do it when you get somebody new in the band, because you got to let them, you know, you got to work out how, we read all of our songs together, so it's like we have to work out how Scott works too, and, and he just fit in great in the process. It was it was awesome. Cool. And one song that you didn't write, but you definitely did an incredible arrangement with that's on the record is the Motorhead cover. Uh, I don't believe. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. What is it? I don't believe a, yeah. wor- a word, right? I don't believe a word, which is kind of yeah, uh, off right. of Overnight Sensation. Kind of, a, I would call it an off the beaten path motorhead song what what inspired you to pull this song out and and cover it where you know where did that idea come from i was actually with len at the rainbow one night uh after we went to go see metallica at the wilter and they were playing a benefit show which is a, a you know theater here in la and it's pretty small and we went to the rain, the rainbow after, and we met up with Lem, and he was there, you know, in full regalia. Right. And he and I just started talking about what the the best lyrics were that he ever wrote. I, I think I said it to him. I'm like, you know what, the best words you are, the wor- best words you ever wrote are is is uh, I don't believe a word, you know, off of overnight sensation. And he was like, what? And I was like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like that 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 those words like are your most honest and feel like you know that, that they're the most um, you know, genuine and self-revealing lyrics you've ever written. And then he started quoting me the lyrics to the title track to the, to, to the album 1916. Right. And then, I, and then, I, and then I kind of looked at him and he goes, "Those are the best words I ever wrote." And I'm like, "Nope, you're wrong." I'm like, "It's don't believe more." And I'm like, "And the second best words you ever wrote are orgasmatron." So, and then he started laughing, and I started right. laughing. He was just like, "Who's going to sing that song live?" He goes, "You know, who's going to sing the backups live?" You know, he goes, "Phil." And then we kind of laughed and whatever. I don't know. It was kind of an awesome moment. So oh, then, yeah. when he passed away, you know, when he passed away, like he was just one of those people that, you know, like you've met a million of these these people in your life too, you know, doing what you do. And we've been lucky enough to meet so many of these folks and go on tour with them mm-hmm. as a band over the years and just be so, you know, genuinely, you know, I hate to use the word blessed, but, you know, yeah. lucky. Right. And, you know, Lem was one of those guys that was like, the re- you know, he was so much the real deal, you know, like, and, and, and like, just like not, there was no you know, pretense and no nonsense and no, you know, no BS. And, and I thought he was an amazing songwriter. So for this record, when he, when he passed away, you know, I had asked the guys in the band, I'm like, Let, they have this, this song that I think is amazing off of this, you know, record overnight sensation. And, and it's not a huge song, but I think we could do a really awesome, like, you know, 
acoustic based uh, arrangement of it and to show people how great of a songwriter he was and how amazing, you know, how, how his melodies were amazing and just like how he was actually, you know, it's just a side of him that people normally don't see. So, you know, I think it came out pretty good. Like we, I, I was definitely concerned because, you know, there's a lot of people that are like, would be like, why the hell would you do that to a motorhead song? But right. I don't know, man. No, it turned out great. It turned out great. Uh, and thanks. You know, and I, I think Lemmy would be proud. I mean, the one thing I, I recently went back and read his, uh, 2002 autobiography and the one thing he seemed even oh, yeah. back at that time in 2002 he really struggled with the fact that that every time he'd go out and talk to people they'd be like you know ace of spades what a great song i love that song and they'd always talk about that song that record and, and he he seemed very frustrated that people didn't embrace all the hundreds of songs that he gave us you know so i, I think it's cool that you're you're shining light on a, a song that Again, that's is, rad, dude. That means a lot. Yeah, a little off the beaten path as far as Motorhead songs go. That's cool. That's good to know. Because honestly, like you, you worry because you know people have their opinions, you know, and in today's right. day and age, they're so free with them, and they can <laughs> express their opinions in so many different places, you know, negatively and positively. So you just hope that people are going to accept what you know how you feel too. I guess. Absolutely, definitely, and. Let's talk about some of the other stuff you've been doing outside of Fireball Ministry because, again, there's a lot of it. The company band, I, I was digging the stuff you were doing. Oh, with yeah. Them. You guys were active for, I guess, like a four four or five-year period, like 2008 to 2012-ish. Could that ever resurface again, or is that kind of a done deal? I don't, I don't know. You know, like, Neil Fallon is the guy who, you know, from Clutch, who, who sings on the project. He's, he's the guy that he's the most busy of everybody touring wise, you know? So it's like, it's hard cause you know, Neil, clutch is like a, a touring machine and, and that's how they, you know, survive. So, you know, I mean, never, I would never say never, but there's definitely no plans of it in the future. I mean, I, I think CKY just put out a hell of a new record personally, um, called the Phoenix. So right. Jess is busy too. And, and now we have this record out. So, you know, it's just fun. And I'm sure Fumi too, we putting out a record the other day now. So, yeah, you know, everybody seems to be kind of busy in their own thing at the moment, but I would never say never, you know. Yeah, good, cool. And, you know, I first met you when we worked together at VH1 way, way back in the day, and you still obviously have your hand oh, yeah. in uh, the television business, <laughs> yeah. providing some, and movie business, too. I mean, first, let's, I guess, talk about the movie Sound City back in 2013. It came out. It was about the studio if you haven't seen it, guys, it's a great mm -hmm. documentary. So many different people in it. Um, but let's talk about yeah. one we just recently lost, Tom Petty. Any memories of sitting down with him for the oh, Sound City yeah. documentary? The day that Petty came to the studio to do that interview, um, you know, we we would we would go through all of these these people's different, you know, like handlers, you know, basically, you know, people have people who take care of their business for them. And, and some people had a lot of requests. Some people, you know, had minimal requests. The only thing that Tom, you know, Tom's guy requested was he said, could you guys have some Coca-Cola in a glass bottle that's been refrigerated? Right. And I said, that's no problem at all. Cause it was so like nothing, you know what yeah, I mean? Sure. And Tom, Tom showed up that day, he drove himself and he came in and he looked around at all, you know, the set, which was at you know, the Foo fighter studio out in, in the Valley. And, and, uh, you know, he was just kind of walking around and then I, I, you know, it was time to wrangle him. And I know, you know how that goes. Right. And, and uh, I was like, you know, hey, Tom, you know, this is, I'm going to show you where you're sitting for your interview. And, and I walked him down the hallway. He, he was laughing. I don't know if you, if you watch the movie, there's like the shot of him. He's sitting on an amp and there's like a bajillion guitars all lined up. And he was like basically walking down the row and telling, you know, me and Dave about all the guitars that were there. And like his own stories of like certain like there was a Trini, like a 60s Trini Lopez Gibson, right. and he was talking about that and whatever. And so he got to his, to the area where he was sitting, 
And I said, hey, man, is there anything I can get you? And he looked at me and goes, he said, you know, if you had a Coca-Cola in a glass bottle, <laughs> I wouldn't mind that. I was like, well, it just so happens that we have it. So I went and got it for him. And <laughs> he ended up, that was all he asked for the whole time. Right. He wow. was amazing. I mean, he could have talked for like 20 hours and everybody would have been riveted, you know? Right. And I don't know. That's a big, that's a big loss, man. It, it's crazy how many of these folks, you know, like Dio and Lem and, and him and, you know, all these different folks that were losing, you know, it's like, and, and, and no, and, and that just doesn't seem like anybody's there to replace, you know, all these, this, these amazing people. Right. No, I, I, I hope there are somewhere yeah. there is. Yeah, definitely. We need a, another rock savior to, to grace the earth. Um, you know, there, that movie, Sound City, great, great documentary. Again, if you guys, it's a, a movie that, that Jim worked on with Dave Grohl um, and highly recommended viewing for music fans. I got to ask you, though, there was this rumor I read on a message board somewhere that there had been yeah. <clears throat> some s- music recorded for that. Like you mentioned, there were pair ups of, of different people doing different jams and songs and stuff. Was there a, a song by Stephen Piercy that he worked on with, with Vinnie Apice and some other people that ended up on the, the cutting room floor, never to be heard? Yeah, it was Warren D. Martini playing guitar, uh, Vinny Apice playing drums, Dave playing bass, and Steven singing. And honestly, the way I remember that night was that, you know, like Dave kind of hinted and sent a song, like an instrumental like demo to right. people before the shoot, it, and it was kind of like, uh, you know do your homework before you get there and then we'll try to record the song kind of thing. Right. Right. And, uh, I I just don't, I don't think that they had lyrics written for the song that night. So it was like one of those things where, uh, they went away for, they stopped it. They went away from it. And then schedules just kept not being able to line up to have everybody come back to finish it. I think that's honestly all it was. It was like, Nobody's schedule could line up for, you know, Steven to come back and sing or Warren to come back and finish or Dave to be there for it. You know, like, so it just got too busy. Yeah. So it is true. Right. Somewhere out there, there's a song. There is a song floating around with those guys. With Steve? Maybe you never know. It'll might make it. Like and it was Dave Grohl on bass and Vinny Apice on drums. Uh-huh. Warren D. Martini and, mm-hmm. and Stephen Piercy. Interesting, cool, but not not finished as yeah. long as as far as you remember. No, yeah, it was definitely. I mean, for, as far as filming purposes go, who the hell knows what went on when we weren't around? But right, right. it definitely. They, I know that because we were booking most of the stuff for for everybody to be there, and they just net the, those schedules could never line up to finish that. But who knows? You know, again. Those are like the things that always resurface in like ten years, you know. Yeah, right on. Cool. Couple, couple more questions, then I'll let you go. The the Sound City documentary, of course, kind of uh, would you say it led into the Sonic Highway series or two separate things? Yeah, in Dave's the kind of person. I know Dave's the kind of person that like once he starts doing one project, then his brain starts rolling. Like the minute he's you know knee deep or waist deep in a project his wheels start spinning about the next project. So right. he was talking about Sonic Highways as we were fin- you know, making, trying to make the deadline for Sundance for Sound City. Wow. And then, uh, and then, and then we, yeah, then we just, you know, we put it together because he wanted to write, basically write a, a love letter to, you know, American music and the cities that, 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 that music comes from. So I think we did a pretty good job doing that. I, I really loved working on, you know, both, both the film and the series, it was just, you know, an incredible experience. And just, you know, I, I owe that all to Dave. He's a great dude. I mean, a massive undertaking, just beautifully shot, too. I mean, besides the great storytelling Thanks. of Sonic Highway, it's just a beautiful look to it. Um, you know, I, I random kind of left field question. I noticed Worldwide Pants is one of the, the, production companies one of a bunch of production companies on that was david letterman involved personally in sonic highways or was it kind of just his production company no it was more i think i think you know because dave had 
has such a great relationship with the Letterman folks. When he was going to make a TV show, those guys just wanted to get, you know, get involved and, and, you know, I think kind of help, you know, just give some validity to the series and, and that and, and ultimately ended up in us landing it on HBO, you know, cause I, I you know, like just cause you're a very successful musician and you made a documentary doesn't necessarily mean that you could make a, you know, a compelling television series, right. especially one about music where, you know, like it's hard to get normal people to watch a TV show about music, you know, normal right. people being yeah. people that don't aren't, aren't dorks and nerds and super into music. So, um, yeah, that was how, that was where that fit in. Cool. Cool. So will there be East coast dates for fireball, fireball ministry? I saw like some West coast stuff. I didn't see any East coast stuff. Yeah. Is we're that... doing some West coast dates with, with the band Red Fang. Yeah. So right. that'll be, That'll be cool at the end of the month. And then, yeah, next year, we're hoping to at least be doing, like, some of the, the festivals that happen out in, on the, in the East. You know, I know there's one in Jersey, one in PA. Right. There's Rocklahoma. You know, there's Rock on the Range. We're, we're trying to get on all those, kind of, like, working out a schedule and trying to get to all those and then hopefully do some dates around that stuff when we're in the area. You know what I mean? Very cool. There's one up in Montreal, too, we've been going to for the last few years, Heavy Montreal, which you guys would fit in well up oh, there. Oh, rad. Yeah, it's like metal, punk, you know, sludge rock, and it's just a really great, great festival that a lot of people don't talk about. But it's big, too. I mean, they get, you know, 60,000 people showing up. Oh, uh, it's killer. Cool. Well, Jim, it's been great I talking love, with you. I love me from Canada. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's been great talking with you and catching up. And again, the new record by Fireball Ministry is out now. Remember the story. Uh, best place for people to get in touch with you online is is the Fireball website, I assume, right? That or the Facebook. You know, like you know, we're, like all the social media, like any of the socials, like somebody from the band is always looking at that. You know. Very cool. I, I, I'm, myself, I'm part. I'm, myself, I'm partial to the gram, but you know, and Instagram, that's, that's yeah. me. That's me talking to the young kids. Yeah, the gram did. You know. <laughs> the gram. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I didn't even know they called it the gram. You're way more hip to these things than I am. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know that they do either. I just kind of made that up. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> cool. Hopefully, right. I don't. And that make me sound a hundred years old. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Awesome, dude. Cool, man. And good we'll have, to talk to you. Good talking with Definitely. you. We'll have links up in today's show notes. And uh, yeah, thank you, Jim. The Reverend James Rhoda from Fireball Ministry here on Talking Metal. It's been a while since he's been on the show. So glad to have him back and reconnect with him. That right there, a little brand new Fireball Ministry off the album, Remember the Story. That one was a cover of the Motorhead song, I Don't Believe. Cool, John. So, you know, Jim also did some production work, I did, you know, as far as producing bands go, not not TV, which I didn't talk to him about. And I wanted to play right now, if you don't mind, uh, a song by Huntress. Do you remember this band? Definitely. I think it's very cool that uh, Jim is producing not only Huntress, but other bands as well. Yes, absolutely. And this is a song that is co-produced by, by Jim. This is called Sorrow by Huntress. That was Huntress with Sorrow, produced by Jim Rhoda, our guest on today's episode. Now, that girl who sings, that lady who sings for that band, Jill, her name was, she was on Talking Metal like before she was doing metal. She was like this DJ, 
And back in the day, she like was at a club DJing, and Axel came in, and we interviewed. Do you remember this? And we interviewed. I remember her. that. Right, right, and right. I totally remember that. She said something about Axel. I think her name was right. like Tuesday or something. She went yep, by a yep, different yep. name back at that point. <laughs> and she was like calling me like all night long because she was freaking out about something that was in the interview that she said about Axel. And she was like demanding I, I take it down and re edit it because she was uh, afraid that something was going to happen. Uh, I, I don't remember, but that was the same girl. She was like, <laughs> and Axel had had asked her to place 50 cent and i it was so it was so weird but anyways yeah i i remember that now i remember we had her on and then i remember there was a scandal uh, involving something and which may or may not have uh, developed into a scandal i i can't remember that but i just remember the the uh the, the fact that there was a possible uh, issue of us re-editing a podcast and something like that. Yeah, but, I'm, I'm trying to re- I'm like googling it to see what her DJ name was. I, it was like right. Tuesday something. Yeah, <laughs> I might maybe it was Wednesday. I don't even know. Um, it could have been Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, Tuesday, uh, talking metal. Let's see if it comes up in Google. Uh, Axel, old. I remember that. I, I just remember what you look like. And... Yeah, I can't find it. Oh, well. Yeah, don't worry about it. That's all right. We can. Anyways. <clears throat> yeah. Speaking of Axel, you and I, John, were just at the Guns N' Roses concert. That was a great show. That was unbelievable. And and for all of you guys that may not know this, Guns N' Roses plays like three plus hours, and it is out of control. They they went on at seven forty five, and yeah. they ended. At I think after 11, I mean, it was amazing. They, they had an amazing show. I, I, I'm not just saying this because we're guns and roses. Uh, you know, the guys that did the podcast about guns and roses, I'm saying this because I 100% believe that this was one of the best concerts I've seen. And I can't tell you how long it, it was unbelievable. Yeah, it was great. And, and, and the band you, was great. If you show up to these guns and roses shows thinking that, you know, the guns and roses of, five years ago is going to come on at like 10 30 11 o'clock midnight you're wrong <laughs> you're good right. the show will be over by by midnight believe me you need to get there before eight o'clock if you want to see this this whole show I, I think what you said is correct john i think they went on actually at 7 50 that night so wow. definitely get there early guys and it's a long show but it was great i i really really enjoyed it you know, I, I post a picture on Facebook because the show, they did three nights at the Garden and then one night in Newark, which is probably like 12 miles from the Garden. And the Garden shows, I believe, were, were sold out. And somebody had said, oh, well, the Newark show didn't sell out. I will tell you, and I posted this on Facebook, that it looked like every single seat in that place was taken. Yeah, and, I even commented that to you. I said, look at this. This place is completely packed. That's yeah, it. so I f- post this picture on Facebook, and this is what drives me freaking nuts about Facebook, and I shouldn't let this shit bother me. But I'm, I, I, I post it, and it's like a picture of Axel, and you just see this massive crowd, every seat taken at the Newark Prudential Center. And some guy comments and is like, well, it looks like the pit isn't that filled. And I'm just like, <laughs> after I make a big point, it's saying that the place was packed. You couldn't move every right. seat taken. And it's just like, and, and I said, what are you talking about? Which I should have just ignored it. What are you talking right. about? The place was packed. He was like, oh, the pit doesn't look as crowded as uh, I've seen it. It's just like, why do, why do people do that <laughs> on Facebook? It's I know, like, I know. Like, it's they, like, they, every, they... like, Okay, you know, I, okay, so people argue about politics and their their sports teams and and everything else, you know, but it's just like are you serious? I'm going to put up a picture and you're going to try to start something with me right. trying to oh. say that what I'm saying on Facebook right is is false, which if you think that, if you think I'm actually on there lying that yeah. about about the picture that I'm posting, that's fine. Just move on. Just move on. Right. You right. Know? Here's the Seriously. thing. I, I get I get very frustrated about that too. And and uh, uh, I used to get frustrated about it when it came to people commenting on talking metal. Uh, I I no longer uh, am frustrated on that anymore. I I get frustrated at times about people talking about Ace or Kiss. And what what's funny is, and I don't want to offend anybody, but. It, it it seems like there are people that 
A, want to disprove the poster or what you're saying on Talking Metal or what you're posting on Facebook or what I'm saying or posting. And then there are people that just want to, like, in this case, maybe, like, like disc guns and roses they want to oh they, they, it makes them feel slightly better about their self that they want to say oh maybe guns and roses wasn't sold out and 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 you know that's that's completely ridiculous as well and then and then the stuff with kiss there's it, it, like right. people talking about people talking about ace and how he might have kept or not kept his previous demos in perfect condition and right. perfect atmospheric conditions and i'm like you know, I, I don't want to offend anyone, but what I'm saying is this, people, uh, <laughs> and I'm not talking negatively to the, the talking metal listeners right now. I'm talking when I, I didn't when I say people in a kind of a negative tone, I'm talking about the people who are the the negative haters and posters. And and I want to say that as much as you think that, you know, Paul and Gene and Nays and Peter and Eric Singer and Tommy Thayer and all the different people are in Kiss and you think, you know, every detail about them you, you really don't and and uh the thing is is it, it, no one has any idea really you know why things are done a certain way um you know like i, I know that paul stanley uh brick oven pizza set up it, it is a property and I, I know paul stanley a little bit but i don't know every detail about paul's life so it, i'm i'm not qualified to go on the internet and try to critique why paul stanley did or did not do something and and there are these people that that type on these you know blabbermouth facebook and and you know whatever website they're on and um I love the people who type, you know, and have conversations about things like intelligently. But um, w what's crazy, and Gene Simmons even, I forget the the uh, the actual words he used, but he basically said like you get people online who are clearly not qualified to have an opinion on whatever it is they're talking about, but they they uh, they think that they are, and it frustrates me. So I completely understand that and uh, it, it's it's totally frustrating now on a non-frustrating note there's a, a really funny thing happened um a, a friend of mine named billy wilson who is a a great ace fan and a great guy he um posted this picture of ace from the dynasty tour with like what looked like a ray gun that had sparks coming out and there was this big debate on on um whether or not this was actually Ace or a tribute right. guy or what the deal was. And it was so funny because this was a post that this guy Billy Wilson did. And he, he like, I guess it was to me. Sometimes I don't even know how Facebook completely works. But it, when you look at the top, it said Billy Wilson. There was a little arrow and it said John Astronomy. And and it was a post of this. And what I think is the greatest thing is that Richard Fortas uh, chimed in on it and Sebastian Bach chimed in on it. And, and some, one of the guys, I think Billy was like, I'll, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm, you know, I'll give you fifty thousand dollars, and Sebastian, in a like a friendly way, was like, "You guys are crazy!" <laughs> like it was pretty funny, and um, I just thought that this this one posting about Ace and his ray gun was great because right. the you know the the wonder the the uh, what what what, what word I'm, the legendary one of my favorite vocalists ever, Sebastian Bach chimed in on it, and Richard Fortas, somebody that I think is a, an amazing great, amazing great guitar player. player. Yeah. We we saw him at that show, and both of us were looking at each other when he was playing, going. How yeah. great is Richard Fortas? He really, really is a great guitar player. I mean, I'm a guitar player. I can play like one lead. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I just wish that I knew how to play a little bit better. Right. And when, watching Richard, uh, I, I thought he was great. But I was, I was really, uh, I, I thought it was so cool that he chimed in, Sebastian Bach chimed in, and and some really knowledgeable um, uh, Kiss Kiss fans also chimed in, and and. Um, this guy named Roz, he uh, uh, he he really posted some great stuff. And uh, Julian, I'm I'm not sure if Julian um, posted some stuff, but a bunch of bunch of people, a bunch of great friends of mine on Facebook, we're all talking about this. And uh, it's an interesting thing that Ace apparently in two shows uh, in the Dynasty tour um, used some type of a gun thing, and then there was one picture where it looked like he had a um like a little thing in his hand that shot out something that wasn't necessarily really shaped like a gun but almost to appear that he can like shoot something out of his hands so that right was on. kind of a cool thing but uh, anyway that's that's my opinion i'm glad i actually addressed this and thanks to you mark because it is frustrating and 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 the, the thing i want to say is I, I i encourage everybody to leave their comments but I, I i think that they should be 
Um, well, you're nicer than I, I am. I, I encourage yeah, people yeah. not to leave comments. Right. If they're gonna, <laughs> like, on that same yeah, post, on that same post, another guy who isn't a Talking Metal listener, he's like an old friend of mine, which he leaves a comment. I can't believe that in 2017, anyone would even care about this. I mean, which is oh, just like, geez. come on. Okay. Right, I, it's right, cool right. if you don't care about it, but... And and I'm sorry if if you're annoyed by a picture that I posted a picture from the show and it ends <laughs> up in your feed. But if that if that's how you feel about it, remove me from your feed. It's really right, easy right. to do. Un, un, unfollow me, unfriend me, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, right. If you don't want to see my stuff, just do it. Yeah. Right. I, and 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 I have gone through recently and just weeded out a bunch of people because I, I there's certain negativity and BS that. I just can't take some of it from so-called talking metal listeners. So I apologize Uh-oh. if you found yourself recently unfriended from from my Facebook page, but <laughs> <clears throat> I'm there. I'm there to, to have a good time. I, and when people are being negative towards me, or even have a little snide comment, that's enough for me. I, y- y- you're gone. Right. You're gone. Right. Good for you. Yeah. Good so you. on that note. <laughs> yeah. No, I get frustrated too. I get frustrated when some some people say like, "Well, Ace is a, you know, I cannot believe he didn't do this or he did that or this is wrong or this is that." And it's just it's just like, "Oh god." Like like um I mean, it's one thing if you're like someone who uh you know, is a personal friend of his and you have an opinion. And and usually those the people that are actually close to Ace's you know they're, they're smart enough not to to put their opinion on the internet, but um, just because you know it's personal stuff. But like, what kills me is when some random guy you know thinks that they know like, well, you know, Paul and Gene are going to do this, and Ace is going to do that, and this person, like, they, they don't. You okay? First off, you don't know what Paul and Gene are thinking, or Peter is thinking, or Ace is thinking, and. Uh, no matter how many kiss records you have, and I'm so sorry if that sounds negative. I, I don't, right. you know, there are, you know what I mean. Like I, I'm saying, I don't even now. Now I feel like I, have, I hope I didn't alienate anybody, but I, I don't mean that that you can't say here's if you say here's what I think Paul and Gene might be thinking, and it's not like a terribly negative thing. I prefer people keep it like that, but I don't like when people. Like, like for example, there, I, I, here's a prime example, guys. So, it, it, unless you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but like, here, here's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about saying, you know, I, I think Paul like uh, might want to, you know, choose to to do this or do that because here's my opinion. That's fine. But when you put on something like this, this is when I get ticked off. Like, for example, we went out to that uh, benefit that Ace and Gene uh, right. did in Minnesota. Now. I, I, somebody put up a video, and the first comment was like, "Oh my God, Ace came out!" Like the first guy that posted something was like, "I just saw this; it was horrendous. Ace was clearly drunk, right. and it was unfreaking believable." And I was like, "What the fuck are you talking about? He was absolutely not. I mean, we he was freaking great, and yeah. um, the thing is, is that." Uh, we were with Gene the entire day from 8 a.m. until the show, practically. So, uh, you know, if, if you really think that Ace was drunk on stage, he would have had to have been partying with Gene in front of Gene the entire day. And let me tell you, Ace has not touched any alcohol or drugs or any of that kind of stuff for what? What is it? Uh, at least 10, maybe. I, I forget what it is. Yeah, it's over 10, 11 time. years. Like, and it's just out of whack that um that there are like so, so some guy who happens to possibly be in the crowd either that or he, he watched the video but i think he was in the audience says oh clearly ace was completely drunk on stage yeah. like and i i want to say you know what if i, I mean it, it infuriates me that un, gene said it best unqual people who are not qualified to do much of anything um say this kind of stuff and, you know, okay, so you, you go to a concert, you're a KISS fan, blah, blah, blah. You know what? That doesn't make you qualified to to to, either, to tell me what you think Paul Stanley's thinking, to tell me what you think Gene Simmons is thinking, or uh, whether or not somebody's drunk or not drunk or, or what. Maybe you can say, look, I have a feeling – I don't mind if you tell me what you think people are thinking and your opinion, but I don't like 
when like when these uh, so-called people are giving advice like, well, the, the, here's what should happen. I'm, I'm a expert audio engineer and, and I don't like the mix on freaking uh, the monster album. So, I mean, you know, that's what these people are saying. Not me. I'm not saying that. But people are like, ah, I think it should be done differently. Well, if you do, then go get a job. Get in the industry and produce the next Kiss yeah, record, yourself, and then it yeah. could be your fucking mix, you asshole. Like, I, I get pissed at this stuff. Like, if, if you're that fucking cool, go mix the album yourself. Go tell Gene Simmons you can you can produce it better than him and Paul Stanley and whoever they got working with them and do it. But don't just, you know, I, I, I'm tired of hearing people who are just not qualified to have an opinion on something yeah, say well, stuff like that. It's the same same with the podcasters. I mean, we've had people, right. oh, we could do a lot better show than Mark and John do. Well, go do it. You know, go do it. And quite frankly, right. uh, there's, the, you know, back in the day, there were hardly any podcasts, but now it's so easy to put a podcast together, a lot right. easier than when we started. And you know what? <laughs> there's hundreds of podcasts, and, uh, you know, I, I don't really think a lot of them are as devoted or have the... I don't know. I, I'll be quite frank. Yeah, no, you're frankly, right. I don't. Right. Th- frankly, I don't think they're as good as ours. But you know, correct. If you think they are, and you think you can do a better one, go do it. Go do it. You know. Yeah. So enough with that. Let's no doubt on. about it. <laughs> hey, Mark. This was yeah. one of my. Um, this might have been the highlight of my anger on talking metal right. ever. There you go. Well, listen. I know you had a concert recently. <laughs> I know you had a concert recently with Like It, and I want to hear about that. But let's do that in the next episode, since we're already Correct. A, a little uh, a little beyond where I wanted to be with yeah. uh, with the time here on this episode. Big thanks to Jim Rhoda for joining us. Let's end with some more of his music, a classic by Fireball Ministry. This is King. <laughs> <laughs> 